Thank you, ladies, for leading us off this morning. Welcome. Good morning, church. And a special welcome to those of you who are new with us this morning. If you would, let us get to know you a little better. You can do that either by taking a card out of the seat back in front of you, filling out that information, putting it in the offering boxes on your way out, or scanning the QR code that you can find here in your bulletin. And while you have your bulletin in hand, if you would, turn to the final page. In the middle where it says discipleship and fellowship opportunities, a few things I want you to be aware of today. There are lots of things going on, so I'm not going to read all of them. But do remember that there are no evening activities today. Also, be in prayer for our kids as they leave for kids camp today after life group. And then you will get a chance to hear from them next Sunday night. We will be in here next Sunday night um, on July 28th to hear from them as well as any others who have gone on different trips or activities this summer. And do remember that we will not be having life group next Sunday. We're going to be having a reception to send off the youngs. If you would... Please take your order of worship and stand as we prepare to worship as Brother Mark comes and leads us in our Old Testament reading for today. Please take your bulletins and join me in the responsive reading from Job 19. I will read the light print. Please respond by reading the bold. Oh, that my words were recorded that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God.
Please take your order of worship. Let us read together our New Testament reading. This morning it comes from Colossians 3, verses 1 to 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will will appear with him in glory. Let's take a moment now and confess our sins before God. There in the silence in your own pews, and I will lead us in a prayer of confession. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we have just read, your word commands us to set our minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. We confess that our minds are at best focused on benign things of this life, at worst, on sinful things. Our thoughts are impure. They spring from a poisoned heart and they work their way out to the actions of our hands. And it is a terrifying thing to know that all of our thoughts, all of the intentions of our hearts are laid bare before your eyes, your perfect holy and righteous eyes. But Father, greater than all of our sin is the realization that we have a living Redeemer. That you saw all of these impure thoughts well before we thought them and you set your love on us that you sent Jesus to take the punishment for all of these things that we have done and will ever do. And so we can come before you in confidence, knowing that we are forgiven and clean. Father, we thank you for Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray, amen. Here our assurance of pardon, which comes from verse 11 of that same chapter of Colossians. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Stand as we sing, he hideth my soul.
And turn with me to 1 John chapter 4 this morning as we pick back up again in our series through 1 John. 1 John chapter 4, we're going to begin at verse 1 and go through verse 6. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, and therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you have granted us this morning that we would be able to come to this place and to hear your word, to pray unto you, to sing of your grace and your mercy. And I pray, Father, that you would at this time open to us the truth of your word, that we would understand what it says, see how it points to you, and walk in obedience to what you have commanded. Father, in this time, I pray that you would graciously work by your Spirit and that the words of my mouth would simply be the words that you would have said and that your word would go forth and do its great work. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So this week, I ran across a story about a wife who had grown a little frustrated with her husband. And so she, uh, they had been married for quite a while, and it was coming to his 50th birthday, and she decided that she was going to throw him a 50th birthday party. And so she had gone all out on this to try to make sure that this was a, a great festive thing for him. Well, the, the husband didn't take it quite as well as she had hoped. Uh, She had gone to all this effort to throw this party, and he had just been okay with it and just went about his day and never really gave her a lot of uh, thanks for it. Well, uh, some time was going on. Well, this husband had out in the garage a refrigerator where he kept his favorite drink, which was Mountain Dew. And so the husband would go out there, and already we've seen that this husband is a little oblivious, Well, he continues on in his uh, 
state of being oblivious, he goes out and gets his Mountain Dew, and he notices that it doesn't quite taste right. And so he just goes ahead and drinks it, doesn't give any thought to it. Well, this continues on for multiple weeks where his Mountain Dew doesn't quite taste right. And so even when he opens a new two-liter, the next day it seems like it doesn't quite taste right. Well, at the same time, this husband starts to get sick. And so he is getting sick to his stomach, and he's got this sore throat, and, and it just keeps getting worse. Well, finally, after a while, he begins to suspect that something might not be right with that Mountain Dew that he's been drinking. And so he sets up a video camera in the garage to check to see. Now, this is about six weeks later after all of this. And so he sets up this video camera in the garage to see what is going on. And what he finds is, is that his wife had grown so frustrated with him, and the last straw was that 50th birthday party, that she had been putting weed killer in his Mountain Dew for six weeks. Now, all I know after that is that she went to jail, and I don't know what happened to him. But this story, this passage that we're reading here, has much similarity to that. Because the passage that we're reading about is speaking to us about the danger of poison and the damage that poison can do. Now, in that story, that was a poison that had been placed in there that he ingested. But John is writing about a poison that is not physically ingested, but is spiritually ingested. And that does not cause physical harm, but causes spiritual harm that is actually deadly to us. And the poison that John is writing about is the poison of false teaching that is a danger for people that can lead them astray and then lead them into sickness and death. Now, I want to pause for a moment and make a contention to you. Now, I know that there are probably some of you who are sitting there and you are thinking as you hear this, well, what does this have to do with me? Or you might be thinking something along the lines of, well, there goes the preacher again talking about false teaching or theology or doctrine or whatever it is. What does this have to do with me? I've got this. Well, I want to make the claim to you that John is making a contention. And the contention is that this matter is of serious, vital importance for every single one of us. He was speaking to a church that had seen the damaging effects of what happened when false teaching crept in. And so he is speaking to a people who knew just how deadly this could be. And so he is speaking to me and you today. He's making a claim, a contention to every single one of us to listen to this so that we would not follow in the same path that others went down, that we would avoid this spiritual poison that can lead to sickness and spiritual death. And so as we read through this passage, there are three things that I'm going to lay out for you that John is doing in this passage. First of all, John is making a case. John is making a case that there are many false teachers who are out there. And so just as John is making that case to that church, John is making that case to me and you today. And so I want you to see what he says there in verse 1. He says, beloved, remember this is part of his term of endearment for those who are in Christ, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, when we hear that word prophet, we often think of somebody who tells the future. But John is not speaking here about somebody who tells the future, this somebody who is foretelling what will happen. Rather, he is speaking of somebody who is forthtelling, somebody who is speaking and teaching. Often in the New Testament, when it's described as a prophet, it's not speaking about the Old Testament prophet who proclaims what is coming in the future, but rather somebody who speaks and teaches 
the word of God says that this is what God is saying. And so this, hearing this from John, would have immediately brought up for them what had happened in their own church. Remember that there was a group in this church, probably not a small number of people, who had, uh, had heard some kind of false teaching, and they had begun to believe uh, this false teaching. Now, it might have been that there were some people who rose up within the church and who had begun to believe this, or maybe it was somebody who came from another place and began sharing this with the members of the church. But whatever it was, however it started, there was a number of people who began to believe this that began to spread within the congregation. And then as they believed it more and more, they ended up leaving the church and leaving the faith altogether. So this isn't something that is far off from them. Rather, it's something that has deeply impacted all of the members of that church. It would have been fresh on their minds of what they had experienced not long ago. And so John writes this to remind them of the danger that's out there, that there are many false prophets who have gone out into the world, and so that then they would know how to recognize them so that they don't fall prey to those false teachers. And so he says, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit who confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. So the people who had come into this church, they had begun to teach that Jesus hadn't really come in the flesh. Maybe it was that they, uh, they taught that Jesus wasn't fully a man or maybe some other heresy that they were teaching. But when they came, they claimed that they were speaking for God. They claimed that they had the Spirit of God in them, and so their words were from God. And so some of the members of this church had believed that teaching. And so John warns them and says, any spirit, meaning any person who teaches that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh, who does not confess Christ, is the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, you might remember, if you were here just a few weeks ago, that we ran across a passage in 1 John where John writes about the Antichrist. And he writes about many Antichrists have come. And so we read that passage and we said, well, what John is doing there is he is describing how in the future there is going to come one who is the Antichrist, who is opposed to Christ and draws people away to, from Christ to focus on him. But in the meantime, John says there are lots of Antichrists, many who are in the world who are opposed to Christ and are seeking to draw people away from Christ. And so John says here that this false teaching isn't merely a human issue. It's not merely a natural issue, but rather it's a supernatural issue, that there are demonic forces that are actively seeking to mislead the world and, if possible, seek to mislead God's people themselves. So I want you to think about all of the various religions of the world and how those various religions of the world deny the reality of who Christ is. Islam claims that Christ is a prophet, but that he is not the Son of God. Hinduism would say that he is a holy man, but he is not the holy one. Buddhism would declare that he is an enlightened man, but he is not the one who is fully, truly light. And we think about other religions, cults. So many of them begin with uh, an angelic being coming and saying, this is the truth that I'm sharing with you, and that truth opposed to Christ. When we look at all that is out in the world, we see that those teachings, those religions are opposed to Christ. They deny the truth of who Christ is. John doesn't mince any words as he's describing this. He says that is antichrist in origin. It's not merely some 
human thought, but rather it is antichrist. It is satanic attempt to mislead the people of the world. And so if you go down to verse 5, he gives us just a little bit more so that we can recognize false teaching and false teachers. He says in verse 5, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. One of the defining characteristics of false teaching and false teachers is that they often sound a whole lot like what the world says. The ideology that they are presenting often sounds a lot like what the ideology of the world is. And we can think just about a few examples uh, from our own time period to see how common this is. Probably the greatest false teaching that America has exported is the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel says that God's aim is to see you happy, healthy, and wise. Joel Osteen is the poster child for this, and Joel Osteen says, quote, God wants us to prosper financially, to have plenty of money, to fulfill the destiny that he has laid out for us. It's God's will for you to live in prosperity instead of poverty. Now, that sounds a whole lot like the ideology of our age, right? In this prosperous place in which we live, isn't the highest good of our land that you would have this prosperous, healthy life and be able to have everything that you could possibly want? Is it no surprise then that there is a false teaching that comes that says exactly what the world says and puts a religious veneer on it? Uh, just about 15 to 20 years ago, uh, there began to be this highest good in the land was uh, to say that everybody is right in what they think. Tolerance was the highest status that you could have. And so the wrong that you could do, the only wrong that you could do, is to say that somebody else is wrong and so be intolerant. And so it doesn't surprise us then that there began to grow this movement uh, among some people claiming Christ that we cannot say that anybody is wrong, but rather we are to be tolerant of whatever view that anybody has, downplaying belief and doctrine and upholding tolerance for any activity, any sin, any belief. All of this comes out of just simply the ideology of the world being played out into a teaching that then infiltrates the church. Now, I know that you may be sitting there and you're still thinking that maybe this doesn't have all that much to do with me. But I want you to hear John making this case. He is making the case based on having seen what happened within that church, that they were not above the need for watching out because some of them bought into it and they were led astray. And so John is warning the people that's reading this letter, and so he's warning us that this is out there, and it comes in all these various forms. And so we have to keep our eyes open in order that we do not fall prey to false teaching that is present in the world and is so often infiltrating into the church. And so this is the first thing that John's doing. He's making the case. But second... He's sharing a confidence. John is sharing the confidence that the Spirit overcomes false teaching. Now, the message that John has been writing so far could be a little depressing. I mean, there are a lot of false teachers that are out there. There is the uh, spirit of the Antichrist. Uh, There is this satanic influence that is behind this. And all the time that the church is reading this, They are remembering their own friends and family and church members who went through this, abandoned the gospel, abandoned the church, and left. And so all the while, this is something that is just digging into them as they're reading this. But John isn't wanting to leave them hopeless in this situation. 
He's not wanting to just share the bad news with them, but rather he is wanting in this pastoral way to speak to them, to give hope to them. So in verse 4, notice how he begins. Little children. This term that he uses so often throughout this letter to describe the members of this church and the other churches there and his love for them. And as he's dealing with this hard subject, I want you to notice how he's speaking to them. Verse 1, he speaks to them and says, Beloved, I want you to know you're loved by me and by God. And then as he's getting into this hard subject, he looks at them and he says, Little children, this pastoral way of going to them and saying, I know I'm dealing with something that is a hard subject for you. I know that I'm dealing with something that brings up some difficult memories for you because you watched as this happened to people you love. But little children, I want you to understand something true. You are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Satan had come and sought to mislead them. Satan had come and was working in the people who were part of that church. But I want you to understand that you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. For a church that was hurting, for those who were, it was bringing up these memories, these words had to have been like a cool glass of water for a man who was lost in the desert. To hear little children you have overcome, and the one who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You know, they had been through so much, this spiritual battle, and you and I are in a spiritual battle that is no different, no less than what they were in. But the good news of it is greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you are in Christ, if you have been redeemed, then that means you have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within you. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And so John looks at this church, he looks at me and you and says, you can have this confidence that you are Christ, you are in Christ because of the Spirit being within you. And because you have the Spirit within you, no matter what Satan does, no matter how much of a roaring lion he is, no matter how much he is seeking to steal, kill, and destroy, as Jesus says in John 10, no matter how much Jesus, uh, Satan is aiming to do that, Satan cannot roar and snatch and win against the church. He will devour on this earth, but he will not devour and defeat God's children. The fact that they endured that time of testing is evidence that they overcame. You know, there were many who were in the church and who had left. But John looks at those who had remained and says, you stayed. When the temptation to believe this false teaching came, you wouldn't buy into it. You overcame because you have the Spirit of God in you. So little children, beloved, I tell you that you will look out and you will see all the ways that Satan is seeking to devour all the ways that he presents these shiny teachings that seem so appealing, that seem to so often drag people away. But I say to you, little children, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You will not persevere because of how smart you are and how great you are and how theological you are. If it was dependent just on that, we would have no hope. But the hope of your perseverance, the hope of you standing firm, the hope of you not being misled is not because of your ability, but it's because of the one who resides within you. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. This is your hope and your confidence against a roaring lion who is seeking to devour who he can. Now, that doesn't mean that you and I can be free from the worry of false teaching. It doesn't mean that you don't have the ability to slip into error at times. It means that your ultimate security is not found in you, but rather in Christ. 
But John does lay out a responsibility that we have. And that's the third thing that he's doing here. Third, he's giving the command, and that command is to test the teaching. He's giving us a command, and that command is to test the teaching. Back to verse 1. Beloved, do not, here's a command, do not believe every spirit, but rather, command here, test the spirits to see whether they are from God. He starts out with a healthy realism. And that healthy realism is that not every teaching is correct. Not every teaching is from God. There will be people who claim to speak for God, claim to speak God's word, but in reality they are not speaking God's word. They are either speaking their own word or they are speaking Satan's word. Rather, you are to test the spirits to see whether they are from God. You are to test the teaching of the person that you're listening to. Test what you're reading. Test what you're listening to to see if it's from God. Now, we're going to get to the what in just a moment of what we should be testing, but let me tell you how first. How we test the spirits. And so how do we do that? Well, John gives us two ways. First, there in verse 2, does the person in teaching confess that Jesus is God incarnate? Does the person and the teaching confess that Jesus is God incarnate? If someone or some teaching denies that Jesus came in the flesh, denies that he is fully God and fully man, then that person is teaching what is false. But John's not concerned with just the content of what someone teaches. He's concerned also with the confession of that person in their teaching. In verse 2, John says that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Now, when John's using confess there, he's not talking about just making a statement. He's not talking about somebody who just makes the statement, Jesus came in the flesh, that he is God in the flesh. But rather, the confession here is this idea of believing. It's holding on to. It's agreeing that this is who God is and saying that, yes, this is who Christ is. And because of who he is, I believe this and I bow my life before him, trusting in Christ alone. And so John says the first way that you can know whether somebody is false or not is are they confessing this? Not just the content, but their life confesses that this is true. I follow you, Christ. But the second way to test is to test according to God's word. Look at verse 6. John writes here, We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. How do you know what is the spirit of truth? And how do you know what is the spirit of error? You listen to us. Now, who is the us there? I believe John is writing here, he's describing the us as he as an apostle and the other apostolic witnesses. He does the same thing at the beginning of this letter. If you would go back at the very first words that John says in this letter, he speaks about uh, that which was from the beginning, which we have seen, which we have held, which we have beheld with our eyes, which we have touched with our hands. Well, who would have seen and touched Christ? He's speaking about the apostles. And so the apostolic witness that we have, this us, is the apostolic witness that we have in the New Testament. It's the Word of God that is given to us, Matthew through uh, Revelation, but not just there, all of the of Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. So how do you know, how do you discern truth from error? You listen to what God has given us in his word. 
And so speaking as one of the apostles, he says, we are from God. And so there is a reminder to us here of the nature of what Scripture is. Scripture is God's Word given to us. And so when we read these responsive readings this morning, the responsive reading from Job, the responsive reading from Colossians, this is God's Word that we were hearing and that we were speaking to one another. When I read these six verses, it was God's word that you were hearing. When you open up the Bible in the morning and you sit down with your cup of coffee and you read God's word, you are reading his word specifically that he has given and he has given to you so that you would know who he is, what he has said, and what we are to believe and to do. So we stand on this book because it is God's word to us. The cry of the Reformation was sola scriptura, scripture alone. Scripture alone is God's word to us. Scripture alone is what gives, is, is the authority that we stand on for what we are to believe and what we are to practice. In this church, it is why scripture takes the center stage in what we do. It is why we read it responsively. It is why uh, our songs are often filled with Scripture. It is why that the Scripture, the uh, service moves toward the time of the preaching of God's Word. It is why the pulpit stands at the center here. Because we stand on the Word of God alone. And it's the Word of God that guides us in what we are to teach, what we are to believe. It is the Word of God that gives us our hope that we can stand firm. And because it is the Word of God, it has the very power of God. When Martin Luther saw the Reformation sweeping through Europe, he looked at what was happening and he declared that I did nothing, the Word did it all. It's the Spirit of God through the Word of God that calls dry bones to live and brings them to life. It's the power of the Word that is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's the Word that has changed your life and changed my life and transforms us more into the image of God. So when John tells them to not believe every spirit but to test the spirits, he means for them to take God's word and to use it to test everything that they hear by this word and by this word alone. And so I want to give you two categories for what you are to test. Test first what you hear. So right now, obviously, you are listening to me. I would encourage you that you should test what I'm telling you. Every Sunday, you should test, does it match with what God's Word says? Just as you should with anyone who teaches the Word, anyone who preaches the Word. You should test it according to what Scripture commands. But it's not just when a preacher stands in front of you or when a, a teacher stands there or when you turn on the, uh, uh, the TV and see a preacher there or there's a podcast that you're listening to, I, I would encourage you to test what you listen to in terms of uh, the songs that you listen to. And I'm not talking about primarily, you know, whatever uh, playlist you have on Spotify that's the top 40 of today or the 70s or whatever your era was, but rather that the songs that claim Christ to test those also according to Scripture. Because we live in a time period where it may not be that every song that comes from someone who claims Christ is actually speaking the truth of what God's Word says. There's a modern worship song that I love about 95% of the lines that are found in that song. But there's one line that I find just incredibly problematic. It says, speaking of God, you didn't want heaven without us. Now I have to ask, what, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that God wasn't okay with heaven unless we were there? Was God not happy and fulfilled as God before people were in heaven? Uh, is it some sense that God just couldn't have eternity without me, 
that seems to place a really high value on me that is higher than I ought to have. Song lyrics have a way of getting stuck in our minds. Now, I am under no delusion that you memorize every word that I say to you. But my guess is that you have thousands of verses of songs in your mind. I think one of the reasons that I have trouble with names today is because I have every song from the 80s and 90s rattling around in my head. There is something about the way music functions in our lives and in our minds that we're able to remember these lyrics that are put to music. If that's the case then, it ought to be that we would be very cautious and careful about what we listen to, particularly when it comes to something that claims to be speaking the truth of the Word. You know, it was often the case that uh, hymns used to be written as a way to teach truth, particularly as a pastor might be uh, uh, preaching a sermon. And so, uh, a lot of our hymns, such as um, uh, John Newton, uh, writing hymns that would have been to teach his church truth and would sometimes be going along with the passage and sermon that he was teaching at the time. Because there is this knowledge that when we sing something, it has a tendency to get stuck in our minds you are gleaning as much theology from what we sing and what you listen to as what I stand here and preach to you. And so it's one reason why we are very careful about which songs we sing and which songs we don't sing. And so we need to be critical listeners, critical in a good way, in which we're testing what we listen to. The podcasts, that preacher that you listen to, the, uh, the books that you read, uh, all these things, testing those things. Which leads me to this second area of what you're to test, and that is what you are to read, or what you read. Uh, my old pastor, I remember him saying one time that one of the most dangerous places that a Christian could go is into a Christian bookstore. Now, if you work in a Christian bookstore in here, I'm not speaking anything negatively against you, uh, but there are things that you could go into assuming that whatever you pick up off the shelf is going to be okay, just like that guy went into his garage and went into that refrigerator and assumed that anything he pulled out of the refrigerator was going to be okay for him to drink. There are times where there's just a little bit of error mixed in. I read today or earlier this week about uh, a guy who had a Christian calendar uh, purchased, I'm sure, from some book Christian bookstore. And in it, it had every day this kind of an inspirational thought or a uh, a verse from Scripture. Uh, And there was uh, one in there uh, that said in it uh, this statement, this kind of inspirational thought. If you worship me, all will be yours. Now, does anybody remember who said that? Satan. (laughs) Satan was the one who said that to Jesus. You worship me, I'll give you all that is here. It sounds so great, right? If you worship me, everything will be yours. But that's not a biblical teaching. That's a satanic teaching. But yet it was found in this inspirational calendar. We must be diligent to carefully look at what we read, the books that we open up, the Bible studies that we have, the devotionals, and, and do a kind of scriptural just analysis. Is this according to what God's Word says? Now, while, while you've been listening to me this morning, I, I kind of wondered what you've been thinking. You know, there's probably some of you in here who you're like, I, yes, I get that. I understand about false teaching. I understand about the, the danger. Uh, there might be some who are thinking you know, that that's not something that's ever going to trip me up. Or, or maybe it's that, you know, I've, I've not really thought much about this before. 
sometimes false teaching is easy to see. The prosperity gospel should be something that's easy for us to, to see and analyze, that that's not right. But sometimes it's a little bit more camouflaged and it's harder, and we need to be diligent to watch out for it. When I was, uh, when I was a kid and a teenager, I was uh, in Boy Scouts. And because we spent a lot of time outdoors, uh, one of the things that we learned was how to identify venomous snakes. So we would learn the patterns that were on the snakes so we could watch for them. Uh, we, could, we would learn kind of the shape of the head so we could understand which one was venomous. And we even learned kind of where they would uh, fi- normally be. We would go out in the woods and we'd pick up rocks to see, okay, that's where a snake would probably be. We learned how to wa- walk through the woods. You know, when you go through the woods, you don't just step over a log to the other side, but rather you step on the log because it might be that there's a snake kind of tucked under the edge that you don't see. So we learned all these things. Well, one day I had gone on a canoeing trip, and I had been through all this training, understood. I'd searched for snakes. I'd found snakes. And there was a particular section of rapids that were, were pretty difficult, and we decided to portage around it. And so that meant that we would have to take the canoes out of the water, and we would go on a little trail Uh, to go around these rapids down to a little gentler area. And so we did that, and I was kind of in the lead, and me and my buddy were carrying the canoe down the path, and and the folks who were behind us seemed like they were just taking a really long time uh, to get down. And so after a while, they finally uh, got down the trail carrying their canoes, and and they said, did you see the copperheads? And I said, no. What are you talking about? Well, they were, there were two copperheads right there on the trail just past a log. Did you not see those? And even though I had known all of this, I could identify them. I'd been taught how to walk through the woods and step over the logs and, and not put my feet right next to it. I had done exactly what I knew that I shouldn't. But by God's grace, me and my friend did not get bitten by the copperheads. It's not uncommon that the teaching that we encounter can be subtly hidden, might not be readily apparent to us, and so we have to be cautious. Now, I'm not saying for you to be looking under every rock and bush to try to find that that one little way that your Sunday school teacher's uh, words didn't come across exactly as uh, you wanted and thought it should be. That's not what I'm talking about. But rather, I'm talking about this this pattern of holding on to a false doctrine and seeing how it plays out in teaching or a book or a song or whatever it might be. Because John is saying that it's more dangerous than we realize. So watch out. Be careful. Test it all according to God's Word. Now you have the great hope and assurance that if you're in Christ, you have the Spirit in you the Spirit to strengthen you, protect you, guide you into all truth. But we have the command to be diligent, to watch out, and to test everything. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how it's true, and we can stand firm on its truth. I pray, God, that you would help us to test everything and that we would affirm your word and cling to it, and that you would protect us from those ways that are false. I pray for this beloved congregation. God, protect us from Satan. Protect us from the spirit of the Antichrist who would want to mislead, to drag people away into error. Let us stand on your word joyfully, unwaveringly in all things. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. In just a moment, we are going to come to this time where we have the Lord's Supper together. It's, It's a special, precious thing that we do where Christ has commanded in his word that we are to gather and that we are to partake of this. Because when Jesus gathered with his disciples shortly before he was betrayed, he explained to them that these elements point to the truth of who he is and what he came to do. His body broken for us, his blood shed for us. And so it's given for Christ's followers. And so this morning, we're going to partake of this. 
And if you are a baptized follower of Christ, member of a church that preaches the same gospel that we do, I'm going to invite you to partake of this as well. If you're not, I would invite you to let the elements pass and to rather think upon the truth of what these elements represent. We're going to, in just a moment, sing. Let it be a time of reflection in your own heart, confession of sin, thinking of the goodness of Christ, and then shortly we will partake of this together. So Pastor Zach, come lead us as we sing together this morning. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with the disciples, broke the bread, and he explained to them that this is his body, which was broken for them. He took the cup, and they shared the cup, and he explained to them that this is the blood of the new covenant, which was shed for the forgiveness of sins of many. 
as we come this morning, it's a special, unique thing where we are partaking of this to remember what Christ has done. As we do so, we're encouraged together, pressing on in Christ together, keeping our focus on Christ, the author and perfecter of a faith. As the elements are passed, we sing. We think about what Christ has done. We confess our sin. We look to Christ. Let's partake together.
is a reminder of what Christ has done. We bring out this bread. We think about Christ's body, which was broken for us. Take this in remembrance of him. As we come to the cup, we remember Christ hanging on the cross, his blood being shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Take this in remembrance of him. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you have given us such a visual reminder of what Christ has done. We thank you that our Savior came, fully God, fully man, lived the perfect life that we could not, died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. Lord, we pray that you would help us to live in a manner pleasing to you and worthy of the calling with which we've been called. God, I thank you for this time that we've had together. I pray that as we go, We would go in peace, proclaiming Christ on our lips with great joy in knowing our Savior. We think of the kids and the adult leaders who are going to kids camp uh, just this afternoon. Pray, God, for safety for them as they go and for your gracious work in the lives of those kids. Show yourself to them, Lord. Let them see the beauty and the glory of Christ. Let them see their own sin and their need for a Savior. We pray that you would do gracious things among them in this time that they're at camp. As we have life groups, we pray, God, for the teaching of the Word that would happen there, that you would use it to strengthen and edify your people. We pray for the fellowship that would take place, that you would deepen relationships, that we would have greater joy together with one another. We thank you, God for all your abundance of grace that you've shown to us. We pray this in Christ's name.